Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Joe Singer. I'm the Magid at the JCC of San Francisco. That means I'm one of the Jewish educators in normal parlance. Um, I'm also kind of a, a food freak and am really excited about the way that food figures into Jewish identity, particularly American Jewish identity. So this is a really awesome event that we're super excited about sharing with everybody. Um, <clears throat> You can use the chat during the um, during the demonstration and the conversation as much as you want. I think it's going to stay open the whole time. Yeah, Gail, will it be open the whole time? Yeah. Okay. So feel free to use the chat um, for the time being. It'd be awesome if you muted yourself so that you can um, so everybody can hear uh, the presenters. Um, if you're having any kind of a difficulty technically, um, just let Gail know. Um, I think she's writing the the tech stuff. So if you get locked out or something like that, Gail would be the person to, to uh, message. Um, we are really excited about rolling out both this book and our um, collaboration that we've been having with the farmer's market in, uh, on, on, at the Ferry Building for these many years. For the last several years, we've had a big Sukkot um, celebration there. And so for those of you who've never been in a sukkah before, it's like a shack. It's a shack you build yourself. And it's a way that Jewish culture has asked us to remind ourselves of both our fragility and our abundance. So it's a place where you get together with your friends and you eat and it's harvest time and you bring everything in. You bring in ancestors and you bring in love and you bring in fullness and beauty. Um, it's also a flimsy little structure that you try to spend some time in during one of the most unpredictable times of year in terms of the weather. So it's, uh, it's this beautiful metaphor for how strong and full and rich life is and also how tenuous and fragile. And if there was ever a time that a sukkah had meaning, now is that time because we certainly are all feeling kind of fragile and delicate and vulnerable, but we're also feeling strong and full and powerful. And so we're in that, we're just finished that holiday. And today is actually Simchat Torah, the day that we celebrate the reception of um, the intuited tradition, Torah, um, which usually is presented in a book. All of these books behind me, that's like a lot of Torah behind me. So what a perfect day to be celebrating a new book than Simchat Torah. So um, the book that we're celebrating is right here, Eat Something Already, that um, Rachel Levin and, um, and our amazing chef, um, Evan Bloom, um, put together. And they'll be, we'll be referencing the book and we'll also be learning a little bit about how to cook one of the dishes. Um, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sasha Hippard, who is going to lead us in a little meditation. Thanks, Jos. Um, yeah, I think I second everything you said is the beautiful words about Sukkot. And also one of my favorite parts about it is that it's, you know, not just a week of opportunities to kind of spend more time with one another to with your own community, but it's also a really active invitation to sort of reach out to your neighbors and your communities that um, you haven't been able to connect with as much. And um, I'm going to lead folks in a little vegetable meditation, which we do with our fellows on the farm and I love. And so for the people who have their videos off, feel free to keep them off. But if you would like to turn your video on and show off a vegetable of your choosing, we'd love to see what you got. It doesn't have to be the delicata squash. It can be maybe the vegetable that you are the least familiar with, or like Susan, who is just in abundance of, of possibilities. <laughs> and we can all just settle with our vegetables. Take a little breath. And as you consider your vegetable, Maybe turn it around. Think about how is this vegetable grown? What direction does it grow in? Think about all of the resources that it takes to create something like this and how that is now 
going to come and nourish your own bodies. Yeah, I like what Gail's, Gail's screen is doing. Smell it. Maybe squeeze it. <laughs> Consider the water. Consider the sunlight and the soil. How many hands and whose hands did it take to get this beautiful piece of nourishment to you? And consider, of course, what conditions the vegetable was grown in. With fires all over California, was it grown in proximity? Was it grown in fear or despite the fear that it might interact with those fires? Was it grown safely in a greenhouse? And as you consider your vegetable, I invite people to unmute themselves and offer a gratitude that comes, a gratitude for the meal you're about to make, a gratitude for the labor and love that went into what you're about to enjoy, but feel free to unmute yourselves and share. Well, when I went to the Monterey market yesterday and picked up the delicata squash and some other goodies, and I thought, what have I never cooked with? And especially in this season, the root vegetable rutabaga. I've never dealt with one, so here it is. <laughs> I would like to give gratitude to my neighbor who gave me the beautiful plant to grow this beautiful pumpkin. So this pumpkin has only touched my hands, <laughs> but the plant has touched too. <laughs> it's beautiful. I'll get one more, one more gratitude or even just an observation, something you're seeing that you've never seen before or thinking about that you've never thought about before. Hi there, this is, um a shallot, which has become like such a staple in our cooking these days that like, I worry about running out of shallots. Forget about toilet paper, shallots, gotta have them. <laughs> Caramelized shallots. Beautiful. Well, I offer, I offer this curiosity and these gratitudes for our food that we eat, as Joseph was saying earlier, um, when we were all chatting, the food is going to become you, <laughs> um, to paraphrase what you were saying. So it's always wonderful to take an opportunity um, to consider in new ways. And I'm just gonna drop a couple of links in the chat for people to, who are curious um, to explore later on. Um, we have the Sogorite Land Trust, uh, which is a group of indigenous women um, who are working to, um, create resources and land for native Ohlone folks in the Bay Area. Um, and you're able to participate both directly with their farms and gardens as a volunteer or by paying your annual Shumi land tax, which is a great way to donate directly to this wonderful effort, um, much in the same way that you would pay any other kind of tax. Um, it's something that we offer um, in support of everyone's benefit. Um, we have Pi Ranch down in Pescadero who was badly burned during the fires and are accepting volunteers. They are currently harvesting these squash. If you are looking for an opportunity to really know where this comes from, it's, you should uh, give them a call. Um, My Puente is also um, nearby and they are providing resources directly to uh, farmers who have been um, unhoused due to the fires and are still working. Um, so they're a great resource. And then of course the United Farm Workers um, who are consistently supporting um, all of our uh, wonderful farmers in California um, and especially during this time. 
So those are some resources for people to continue their curiosity. Mm. And um, thank you so much to cooking. Thanks so much, Sasha. And uh, just to make sure everybody knows, Sasha's at Urban Adama, another amazing organization in the Bay Area that's doing so much to um, wake us up and remind us what's under the asphalt. Um, I know that site very well. I knew it before Urban Adama was there and it was a red hot mess. And it is a beautiful oasis in the middle of a very industrial part of Berkeley. So if you've never been, I encourage you to go and, and Check it out, it's a gorgeous place. Thank you for all you do, Sasha. Um, so here we are, like Jewish, hash, Simchat Torah, Sukkot. How does that all fit together? Um, I'm gonna hand it over to our holy brother, Chef Evan Bloom to sort it all out for us and make some sense of why we're having hash this morning on this beautiful harvest day. Evan. It's yours. Right. How's it going, everyone? Thanks uh, to Urban Adama, JCC, Kwesa. Um, We're thrilled to be here digitally. Um, Evan Bloom from Wise Sons. Uh, hopefully, you've all been to one of our locations or had some of our food. If you haven't, you should. That's my guilt trip for you. Um, so we're going to make a, I guess we'll call it a fall hash today, but but really, you know, hash is just, just a mixture. Um, you know, with the deli, we started with a corned beef hash, which I think most people know. Um, corned beef, peppers, onions, um, greater than the sum of its parts. Um, corned beef hash is, you know, the leftovers. It's what do you have that you can chop up and sell or eat? Um, we started doing a vegetable hash when we first opened the restaurant um, that changes seasonally. Uh, it was an opportunity, you know, we've been selling at the Ferry Building for almost 10 years um, since actually before uh, the restaurant opened. Uh, so it's an opportunity to use awesome produce, um, do something different and exciting because honestly making pastrami sandwiches every day can get a little bit stale. Um, and, you know, there's just so many different things you can do. Um, you know, I, I, I've got the box here. Um, I'm going to kind of walk through a few of the vegetables um, that everybody has, um, if, whether you got it from Quesa um, or your own market. Um, I heard somebody mention Monterey Market, one of my favorite places um, over in Berkeley. There's a lot of really great uh, local stores. If you, This is my, my plug here. Shop, shop at the farmer's market, shop direct from farmers. CSAs um, and, you know, small local grocers. So we have here some purple carrots from, I believe I have it here. Purple haze carrots from McGinnis. McGinnis is awesome. Um, they actually were next to us on Tuesdays when we first started the farmer's market. Um, really beautiful flowers, carrots, green beans, strawberries. Um, I think they're doing jams now. Um, and some other value add products. Um, we eat a lot of carrots in my house. Um, <laughs> number one, I cook them for my, my daughter who's nine and a half months old. She loves carrots, um, pureed or steamed. Um, but also, you know, they're a great substitute for potatoes. Um, so in this hash, you could also use carrots instead of potatoes. My wife's diabetic, so we try and um, go easy on some of the white starches. So carrots are great. Um, if I'm roasting a chicken and there's actually a recipe in our book um, for a chicken with roasted potatoes, I'll throw in, you know, 50% uh, carrots. Uh, just cut the same size so they cook um, in the same, the same time. Um, and they're a great substitute. They take on the flavor. Um, you know, with these farmer's market carrots, they're a little bit smaller. You don't even need to peel them. Um, you can just snap off the ends and the stems and clean them really well. Uh, the skin's not anything you really need to worry about. Um, and, you know, you've got the, the greens as well, which make, uh, you know, pestos and uh, chopped up as an herb. Um, they're really great. Actually, we could toss it into the hash too to add a little bit of bitterness. Um, we've got leafy kale from... 
Oya well, yeah, Organics, um, another great uh, stop at the market. Um, leafy kale is great for everything. Um, I put kale in salad. You know, the minute I get home from the market, I take all my greens, chard, kale, collard greens, and I like to cut them up, wash them, cut them up so they're in the fridge, and I can just, if I'm scrambling eggs in the morning, I can throw a handful in, or if I've got something braising and I want to stretch it, or I want to add veggies, just throw a handful in, give it a stir. They're just ready. That's one of the things. Um, if you're doing a CSA or you're going to the market, you come back with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, for me, my refrigerator can't fit it all whole. So what I'll do is just, you know, come home and I'll try and find the time to clean everything, break it down, uh, put it in nicely into containers, not necessarily cooked, but just ready to use. So you're more likely to actually use it before it goes bad. Yes, red leaf lettuce, uh, Korean American wife, we eat a lot of psalm. <laughs> uh, so we're eating this, you know, multiple times a week as a lettuce wrap. Um, you know, farm lettuce from the farmer's market is just like leaps and bounds better than anything that you're going to get at the grocery store. Highly recommend one of the, if you're going to the farmer's market, and you're also going to the grocery store, lettuce is something I would get from a small farm. Um, it's just so much better. Um, also great sauteed, like with garlic and onions. If you've never had sauteed lettuce, it's worth a try. We've got Brussels sprouts uh, here, which we're gonna put in the hash, which are extremely trendy and popular now. Um, you know, uh, and if they're cooked right, they're delicious and sweet, um, crispy. They're little mini little cabbages, so they fit into the Jewish lexicon really well. Uh, and then, of course, we've got potatoes, russet potatoes. Again, Jewish food, we know potatoes well. Um, this is another thing I always buy at the farmer's market. Um, you know, clean them well, leave the skin on. The skin's got a little bit of flavor and texture. Um, these are baby russets, so, you know, similar to the big Potatoes, you might uh, be grating for latkes or anything else. Russets are a little starchy, which is really nice. Um, they roast well, they mash well. They're all purpose. Um, rosemary, which, um, you know, classic uses in potato, great with the potatoes. In this case, um, I'm gonna throw it in with the hash. There's a mustard and maple syrup uh, sauce that goes over the top. Uh, I'll chop a little bit of rosemary and throw it in, even though it's not in the recipe. Rosemary and mustard pair really well together. Um, what I usually, I never go through all the rosemary I get. Um, so what I'll do is I'll lay it out on the dining room table for a week or two, just let it dry. And then I'll pick all the needles off and put it in a jar and you've got fresh rosemary. Um, do that with thyme as well, oregano. You know, it, it can be hard to use it all up at once, but um, if you dry it out, you'll have it all season long. Um, and then we've got delicata squash. We were talking earlier, delicata squash is my favorite of the squash. Um, you don't have to peel it. Um, it is quick cooking, uh, versatile. Um, my favorite way to eat delicata squash uh, is actually in a salad. Um, I will take these two squash and I'll cut them up. I'll roast them in the oven at like 400 degrees till they're a little crispy on the outside, creamy on the inside and I'll put them in the fridge. Um, and then I'll put a handful on a salad. Um, it, it'll break up a little bit with the lettuce and you'll get a little bit of creaminess and texture. Um, some nuts, some goat cheese or blue cheese or um, feta cheese, if you have that in the fridge, it makes a really, really nice salad. Pairs really well with something acidic as well. Um, this is again, one of my favorite things in season. It is always, always um, in my house. And I'll tell you, this is one thing that, you know, if you get good delicata squash versus from, you know, let's say a grocery store, Trader Joe's maybe, <laughs> um, there's a huge difference. Um, it's gonna be sweeter. Um, the skin's gonna be a little bit nicer. Um, if you don't like delicata squash or you don't think you do and you haven't had, had it in season from the market, I really urge you to try it. So first, we're, to make this hash, um, we're gonna cut up the delicata squash. So I have a big cleaver, 
you don't necessarily need a cleaver. I use this for everything. Um, but a heavy knife is good for cutting through delicata, as you can see, it kind of just kind of sticks. So, and it's louder than it needs to be because my cutting board's sitting on top of my stove. <laughs> so I can show you. So those are the pans. Um, I cut it in half and then take the little nubs off on the end. It's like a mini pumpkin. And then scrape the seeds out. So you can see it's just pretty, pretty simple here. I've got a spoon that's got kind of a tapered end that I like to use for this. And then I just scrape the seeds out. If you leave a little bit of the, the guts inside, it's okay. Um, make sure you get all the seeds. So you got a mostly clean piece of duck squash. And then, you know, depending on the use, I like to cut them, let's say this is like quarter inch, third of an inch, um, and I'll just cut it into little half moons. Um, and this is where I would just toss it with olive oil and salt, throw it in the oven, let it cool, and just eat it all week. So we've got delicata squash, Easy, done, don't need to peel it. Just gonna toss it in the bowl. Potatoes. Um, I like to, uh, to blanch the potatoes because they tend to take a little bit longer to cook. So blanching just means I got a pot of boiling water going with a heavy amount of salt and I'm just gonna cook them for a few minutes um, until they're fork tender. So not too soft, but soft enough um, that you could eat them and they'll continue cooking in the pan. Uh, I, what, what I mentioned processing vegetables when I come back from the market. I like to blanch a lot of things um, in water because then it's faster and easier to use. So I might cook a potato whole um, and then, you know, let it cool, if you smash it with my hand or with the back of my knife, toss them with oil and then roast them in the oven over high heat when I'm ready to eat them. Get really crispy, delicious, starchy potatoes. Um, one of the secrets to crispy potatoes is releasing the starch from the inside. So, you know, when, when they beat up in the pot, that's creating extra starch, which is going to get crispy on the outside. So I'm going to cut these in like half inch. So these are pretty small. So I'm going to cut them in half and then in a quarter, and then I'm just going to cut them in thirds. So they kind of look like that. Um, and I've already blanched these because they take a few minutes, about five minutes in water. Um, so these are already done. So, it, you know, instead of delicata squash, sweet potatoes, uh, carrots, butternut squash is another great thing. Um, it can just take a little bit longer to cook. Um, instead of uh, potatoes, um, you know, I mentioned carrots, turnips, somebody said rutabaga, um, beets. Um, you're just looking for something kind of starchy and creamy. Um, hash is really about, I think it's about the contrasting textures. If you have a bunch of things in there that are the same texture and the same color and the same flavor, um, it's just gonna be kind of flat. So something starchy, something creamy, um, something acidic, like in this case, it's the, the mustard vinaigrette. Uh, but you could use slices of apples or pomegranates. Um, you know, it, it's just really about combining things and greater than the sum of its parts, which is, you know, a lot of uh, what cooking is. Brussels sprouts, everybody knows Brussels sprouts. These are another thing I love to blanch. We won't in this case, um, but I love to cook them for a few minutes, totally dry them out to get the water out, keep them in the fridge, and they roast up really fast without turning mushy and high heat in your oven. Um, they've got a little bit of a, a nub on the end. So I like to just kind of trim off the, the brown part. Any yellow leaves, these are fresh. There really aren't, <laughs> aren't any yellow leaves. And then in this case, um, we're going to cut them really thin so they cook fast. So I just cut it in half and I'm just kind of slivering it. It doesn't really matter. They're going to break up into ribbons when you cook them. So they kind of look like 
like that. You know, instead of Brussels sprouts, we actually, in my house, we eat a lot of cabbage. Um, I love keeping cabbage at home. There's so many different varieties of cabbage at the farmer's market. Um, it lasts forever. Um, you can roast it, you can uh, pan fry it, braise it. Um, it's kind of one of the, you make, serve it raw. It's one of those undersung vegetables. Um, so that would be a great sub here. I think this is like, a handful of Brussels sprouts. I think the recipe says like five ounces. Uh, I have a fancy kitchen scale at home. You don't need that for this. Um, just throwing it in the bowl. And then onion. Somebody mentioned shallots. Um, scall that sh they always have shallots in their kitchen. Scallions are always in my kitchen. I will get four or five bunches at a time. I put them in everything, uh, raw or cooked. In this case, um, I'm just gonna cut them into one inch or so little pieces, and they're gonna cook with everything else. Um, you could use any type of onion. I think uh, with hash, you know, I always like to have some sort of an allium. So red onions, slivered yellow onions, white onions, um, torpedo onions in the spring. Um, scallions are kind of year round, um, so they're great as well. I leave them in bigger pieces so that they actually uh, give some body and flavor. So scallions, everything's getting tossed in a bowl um, with, a, with some vegetable oil. You could use olive oil too. I think vegetable oil crisps better. And some salt. And then I'm going to throw it in a pan. Uh, I have a cast iron pan, which if you don't have a cast iron pan, highly recommended or something heavy bottomed. Um, so you can get a nice crispy layer and then it can go right in the oven. So going to heat the pan up medium high heat, good slick oil. I'm going to throw all this in there and just kind of let it crisp up on the bottom um, and throw it in the oven. Any questions I can answer about this or about any of the vegetables or I've got a question, Evan. Um, you, I, I like delicata too because they're easy to deal with. Uh, butternut squash is like my favorite, but I hate peeling it. What is, what's the secret? What's the, how do I get around that without buying the pre-cut lazy woman's way of, <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, so I have one here. Um, there's a couple ways, um, but you know, you, you have to, pe you, if you want, I guess you can, you can cut it in half like I did with delicata, scoop it out um, and just kind of leave it open faced and just roast it in the oven. It'll get creamy on the inside and you can kind of scoop out the guts and that, you know, you're not going to get necessarily like defined cubes, but you know, you can mush it up with some butter or chicken stock or vegetable stock and herbs. Um, that's a really easy way to do it. But um, the way to do it, if you're going to peel it is you want to cut it in half kind of where the, where it starts to taper. Um, so all the seeds are here. Um, and then you have this kind of top nub and you, like we did with delicata, cut the, the top nub off. And then if you can see, you just kind of want to take your knife and cut the skin away. So you just work, work your way around and then pretty easy to cube up from there. This is sort of similar, but you've got the seeds in this half. So scoop the seeds out, cut the, cut the nub off on the bottom. And then same thing, just kind of use your knife to cut the skin off. You can use a peeler too, but most peelers aren't sharp enough. I mean, they're a huge pain in the butt um, with, with a delicata squash. So, or with a, excuse me, with a butternut squash. So that's how I would do it. Um, it's a little bit of work, but it's, uh, it's not too bad. I've been doing it kind of like that, but I've sliced the bigger part. So then uh -huh. I'm just, uh, slicing off the peel, um, for little pieces instead of 
thinking that I'll get a big piece on the round yeah. part. So yeah, it's tough. And, I mean, you really need a sharp, heavy knife to do it. So I'm just taking all of the vegetables here and just layering them in the pan. So Rachel, should we talk a little bit about our book? Yes. Hi. Sure. <laughs> our book, the recipe is in. Nice. Yum. Um, I'm too a butternut squash like lover hater, so I'm really gonna move over to Evan's uh, delicata squash preference. I'm all about it. Thank you. <laughs> I gotta switch my squash preference. Um, yeah, our book. We wrote it together. Thank you. You're you're the. I think it was um, the little conversation about our book in the beginning that I over, we overheard was so good. I feel like that should be our book trailer. <laughs> that should be our little ad for the book. You guys were great. <laughs> Thank you. You have to do a testimonial for you if you want. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So good. Totally. Yeah. Buy it for your children. <laughs> you might know, cookbook that was different. Um, something that hadn't been done before. I think there's a lot of great encyclopedic. Jewish cookbooks out there. There's a lot of wonderful cookbook authors, old and new, um, where you can get a great recipe for kugel or brisket. And not to say that our recipes aren't awesome. Um, they are. The, the book is about more than the food, as I think, you know, the Jewish eating experiences, you know. <laughs> uh, when people come into Wise Sons, the food is part of it, but there's nostalgia um, that people are creating and there's nostalgia that people are remembering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Evan wanted to do a book that was unlike any any other cook, Jewish cookbook out there, and I had never done a cookbook, nor did I really want to necessarily, but this was well, when Evan approached me um, and my friend George, who designed and illustrated it, about about doing this book, this, like, this is the only cookbook I would have wanted to do, and because it's not a traditional cookbook, I think, um, for me, I'm not a cook, I'm not, I mean, I have become one during this quarantine life, <laughs> more of one than I've ever been. But I, what appeals to me about the Wise Sons and the book uh, was, was doing a project that's about Jews and food, not just Jewish food, um, and about the role that uh, food plays in Jewish life and, in, and throughout the generations and especially today, um, and from Bris to Shiva and all the occasions in between. <laughs> so our book follows that, uh, that sort of organization in a fun way, we broke it into, you know, early years, awkward years, young adult years, all grown up, which Evan now is that he has a kid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we like, Jewish people and other cultures as well. I mean, everything is, everything we do is revolves around food or there's food present. Um, so, and it's not just Shabbat or Passover, but all these other occasions um, that are just as important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and have just as much if not more memory for me uh growing up yeah like our brunch section evan when we when we went through each occasion it was sort of talking about our own memories which were shared across i'm from boston originally evan from la but we have these shared memories and for evan the brunch was his image of sitting on his grandma's shag carpet while the family came in with bagels you know, via golf cart and i was like oh my same with me bagels tropicana golf cart you know sort of this fun memory of, of just food being always present in sort of the unifier um, for every family gathering and friend gathering. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how each occasion sort of is our, hopefully uh, we try to kind of look at our own lives and then hopefully have Jewish Americans relate, uh, relate it to their own and sort of feel that connection um, as well in both, you know, lighthearted memories and, and um, holiday dinners and, and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Where did Joe go? Here I am. Oh, hi. I, I wanted to ask you, um, you, you talked a little bit about having this in the book, you talk a little bit about having this like aha moment at your first uh, Passover Seder with Y Sons. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might, you know, just kind of uh, share, share that out for folks who haven't read the book yet. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and what happened? Yeah, so um, for the Passover section, I dug deep into my mem archival memory of my own Passovers at my grandparents' house in Brookline, Massachusetts. And I'd always be so bored 
and my grandmother's brisket would always be so gray and tough and flavorless and and I'd, my mom would make me wear these tights that always sagged around my ankles and I would just be starving and I just you know I didn't appreciate it at the time whereas now I'd give anything to sit at my grandparents table in Brookline if they were still here um and so so I hated it I kind of dreaded the holiday and dreaded the um the only part I liked was finding the Afi Coleman because I got money and it was <laughs> and it was fun but um so then I went to um when Y Sons first uh had their early pop-ups I was a big fan and then they I saw they were having a public theater where people were going to buy tickets and it was going to be held in the cool cafe in the mission and there was going to be good wine no offense to Joe and his Manischewitz uh <laughs> but you know there was gonna be good wine and no offense the promise, of, <laughs> the promise of good food and um and I brought George as my date who was now the designer of the book and I just sat there and I thought he had um Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments playing on the background and his um, partner Leo Beckerman had these dreadlocks and he was not my grandfather he was some young cool guy um, leading this this service at the table and it was with strangers and it was the gefilte fish was delicious and the whole thing was really fun and I just thought oh wow like this Passover doesn't have to be this sort of staid um, bad brisket <laughs> of vacation it can be something Passover for, for me you know was always at my grandparents house um, you know there was 20 30 people there and it was always the same food and the same, when do we eat and why are we eating this? Can we go get cheeseburgers afterwards? <laughs> yeah, that was the story. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and in college, um, I went to Berkeley and, you know, we, we started to freshman year, you know, my friends and I started doing our own Passover Seder, you know, because we weren't going home for Passover because of the way the calendar fell. Um, so we took it as an opportunity to, to have a party um, at the table. We, we cooked food, we drank way more red wine than, um, than we probably should have. I think I, there's a passage in the book that talks about us having to repaint my apartment because red wine ended up all over the walls. Um, <laughs> but it was, a, it was a celebration and it was that moment where you say, well, these holidays can be more than just, you know, we, we did all the traditions. Um, you know, and we, we ate the, we, we made brisket and we drank our four cups of wine. Um, but then, Thanks. you know, yeah. there, 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 there was room to do things as we wanted. It didn't have to be tired and boring and yeah. around a bunch of octogenarians, which at that time was not something, you know, I really appreciated. Um, now so, we'd love to, we'd love to just mash it up together now, but, but it is our fun about singing Diane around your grandpa's table and in the hip cafe and the mission. <laughs> Which is what we did. Yeah. So. I, I also love how you, um, in the book, you, you are both reverent and irreverent <laughs> to both the people and the food. Um, irreverent in that, you know, it's like, yeah, we're going to make tacos out of that brisket, right? Or, or that kind of thing. Um, and, and reverent in that there's like a real understanding that these foods have taken a role in Jewish continuity, in Jewish identity, in what it means to be Jewish with or without a religious connection, mm -hmm. that, that the, the power of something that you actually ingest, um, right? Something that actually becomes you, um, that is inextricably linked to a religious or ancient tradition, mm -hmm. right? Even if like the religion, whatever, but you know that there is like particularly something like Passover or Hanukkah that is tied to a mythic or historic event. Mm -hmm. Um, you're on delicate territory when you start messing with that. And on the other hand, what's more Jewish than messing with our sacred stories, right? Like what makes our stories more and more sacred is the more we kind of have at them. So I would love to hear about like, is there a particular recipe where you feel like you were really like going for it of like taking this thing and like really up upholding and flipping it all at the same time. Is there anything in particular you feel like, oh yeah, I know that was the reverent, irreverent culinary moment? I mean, 
I like to think about brisket because it's a, you know, <laughs> it's a great conversation about what is nostalgia, what is, you know, where do these recipes come from? When did we start eating latkes? You know, when did latkes become a symbol of Hanukkah? But when did brisket become um, this symbol and why do we remember it with this brown gravy and onions and, you know, it's, it's a product of our grandparents and our great grandparents or our parents, um, you know, and uh, what, what was trendy and what they were cooking at the time, you know, Lipton's onion soup mix, quick and easy things, Heinz chili sauce, um, you know, which is a snapshot in time. Um, and so, you know, we took that. Now we do have that recipe as a footnote. It's a, I think a can of, can of Coke and Lipton's <laughs> onion soup mix. And like tomato. grandma's secret. Um, <laughs> grandma's secret and it's delicious. But we wanted to evoke that flavor without using any of the shortcuts. So, um, you know, a lot of onions, good braised prunes for sweetness. Um, you know, I think, you know, that is a really good um, kind of recipe to think about as being old and new at the same time, you know, and then thinking about where, where you're getting your beef from. Um, you know, that's a whole other topic that we won't, we won't go into, but yeah. And you also, yeah, I would say your latkes, like I would say like kimchi, like a, a kimchi latkes or, um, you yeah, know. With latkes, you know, start with a base, but there's eight days. So my latkes are very traditional, mm -hmm. you know, and I think you have to make them on a box grater. I really do. <laughs> but after that, you're like, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to eat just potato and onion and pancakes every day. So you start, what do you have in the fridge? What are you know, what's culturally important to me? My wife's Korean American. So, you know, <laughs> kimchi and scallions and, you know, that they end up going into my latkes by day three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the tradition now in my house. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, we're, we're trying to create our own traditions while just, you know, yeah. I think Rachel, you said it best. Uh, Wysons has its eye. It's, it's like, it's rooted in the past. Yeah but I in the future. We take it, it what, the future. The past, what makes it taste better. I mean, what I love too is like when I, I was, I think I say too in the book, like being from Boston and moving out here, there's not as much of a Jewish community or I didn't know one when I moved out here. And for me, when I felt like feeling Jewish, I would go to Y Sons or I would eat, and I would eat bagels and I would, uh, you know, I feel like it became a, a Jewish deli became kind of like an unofficial Jewish community center out here for me because the food, as Joe so eloquently put it, is sort of where I, where I find my Judaism or my feelings of um, connected to the culture is through food mostly. Um, and so I think it's important to have these like, it was so fun to take these like sort of these foods that mean so much to our culture from for centuries and, and remake them into something that is very current um, and delicious today. And, 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 uh, and even the matzah, I mean, I thought, I, oh, that was another revelation at the Passover Seder. I'd never had homemade matzah. So that was delicious. I tried to make it this year. It didn't quite go over as well as it should have, but it, the recipe is quite easy. But yeah, I think the food, I think the, we also have a cheeseburger in our book, which was quite controversial. So. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, there's a couple of things that get raised here that I love that you keep coming back to, which is the folks who did not grow up with these foods, who don't have the baggage or the story of, you know, their Zaidi or whatever, these people who are from outside of the, the Jewish world who encounter this outrageous, over the top, I mean, Jewish, Ashkenazi Americanized Jewish food tends to be big and bold, over the top, you know, bowl. It's, mm, it's like, it's like <laughs> giant bites, right? Like you don't, you don't eat it like this. It's not little, it's big and it's brash and it kind of holds in that space of that stereotypical like loud elbows, get out of my way, put a bunch of it on the plate, right? That sort of thing. And I love there's a there's a little piece in here from one of the um, one of the chefs at Wise Sons who's non-Jewish, who is in fact a Catholic, uh, a Mexican Catholic. And he says, um, he, he talks about like encountering these foods for the first time. And he says, for some reason, we get most complaints on Christmas. 
Someone has to wait for a table or wait for their food. People don't like to wait. What else do they have to do on Christmas? Right? He's like, he sounds Jewish already. Like, what did you do to this guy? And then he says, at the end of the long day, Rodrigo usually brings in tamales. We'll get a turkey and have a staff dinner together. Sometimes I'll make everyone brisket tacos or corned beef rice, fried rice. I'm always adding habaneros, pickled onions, and lime to the chicken soup, to the latkes, to everything. Did you know that matzah tastes great dipped in salsa? Like, this is just like this amazing outreach. And, you know, as America has like, I mean, people eat bagels all over the country now. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, like, that's an amazing advertisement for like, hey, if you like our bread, you might like us. And there's a way in which it's like a really a powerful counter to anti-Semitism. I'm going to get that bumper sticker. So All right. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yes, that's good. That's so good. I'd love to hear like, you know, like what part of that, like, I mean, cause you take this out to edges. Like you, you do a little bit of like what the transparent move of like revealing a lot of Jewish dirty laundry. You've got a whole section in the back of people's complaints to delis. <laughs> it's so fabulous, but what would it, it couldn't be Jewish without complaints, Kaval, right? So I love that you took that on and make it human. And, I'd, and if there's any, any way that you, you know, like anything you'd like to add to that, I'd love to hear it. Well, I think that was, we call that the Kvetch department, which I am quite proud of that subhead, that title. <laughs> but, um, but Evan, yeah, I think we just sort of started, part of what we, when we were talking about the book was just, that would always come up, the, the complaints and the, the, and often nostalgia driven complaints, like as Wyson's menu has an asterisk that says under, I think it's matzo ball soup, not as good as your bubby, probably not as good as your bubby's. And so people just, you know, you know, one of the favorite complaints was like, what, what, what do you, what is this? Com kale salad at a deli? What's next? Kombucha? You know, I think, or like everyone wants the free pickles was Evan's like favorite refrain. So we just kind of had fun and he would just send forward me. Remember Evan would just like forward me emails without, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're we revealing we were, secrets here. We knew we were successful when we gave people a reason to complain. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but I do think that I love your point about if you like our bread, you might like us. I mean, I do think food, that's what also with the book, we wanted to speak beyond, you know, it's for food lovers, it's for Jews who like food and food lovers who like Jews. And we, and we mean that, and we meant that in a very real way. The book is for everyone but the anti-Semites. It's for people who, who love to eat brisket and love. But maybe it's for the anti-Semites so they can try our matzah. Yeah. <laughs> Right, we should try to win them over. Mm. Chicken soup. But but yeah, I do think that's a, it's a, we hope, I mean, the book, I hope, you know, it's obviously very Jewish and very um, irreverently Jewish, as you say, but also I hope that there's enough, I have so many friends growing up that, that really wanted to be Jewish, you know, very waspy or Asian people who wanted to be Jewish. And, you know, I wrote this book just as much for my friend Kim Wong, who calls herself Kim Wongstein. Or my friend Lucia Nunziata, who calls herself Lucia Nunziataberg. <laughs> you know, people who love who love the Jewish culture just as much as um, they love our food. And so, just so everybody can see, this is, this is basically done. Um, I did not put it in the oven um, as a recipe instruct because I actually melted a plastic lid in my oven earlier this morning when I was preheating it. So, but that kind of speaks to you know. <laughs> you can change the way you do things. I just kept tossing it on the stove. Um, you can see like crispy edges, the squash is cooked through because it's easy to kind of push through with a spoon. Um, and that's it. Um, serve it as a side. We're going to eat it for lunch on its own. Um, I mixed some mustard and maple syrup together. I didn't have whole grain mustard, so I used Dijon. Um, I don't have pumpkin seeds as the recipe calls for, but I have sunflower seeds, so I toasted those. I have some sesame seeds to add texture. I have some French's fried onions that I'm gonna throw on top. You know, it's kind of whatever. So, just wanted everybody to see that it's done now. Looks delicious. Looks great. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Um, thank you both so much for taking this on creating this amazing, hilarious, nostalgic, innovative, reverent, irreverent book to add to the tone, as you said, of many of the 
I mean, there's been a, a, a wave of uh, spectrum of Jewish cooking that has hit the hit the um, the shelves in these last like ten years, beginning with Odo Lenghi, you know, opening that all up, and um, most recently, I think of the Gefelta Manifesto. But you and the and the folks of of the Gefelta Manifesto are working with a lot of the same um, culinary traditions, but in such a radically different way. Uh, such a radically different energy, and I'm really grateful to have this because it's playful and fun, and it gives it gives everyone permission to dive in and and check these foods out, and not feel like you're dealing with uh, a museum piece, mm -hmm. but rather with something that's alive and vibrant and and still evolving. Um, as is this hash. I mean, we were talking about why hash. Well, it's diaspora. You know, when you end up someplace and you've never seen a delicata squash before, you better figure out how to eat it or you're going to starve. So that's another component. Like that's one of the great, you know, what do they say? The greatest spice is hunger. And Jews know a lot about hunger. Jews know a lot about eating. Jews know a lot about how to make something that you've never seen before turn into your new best friend. And <laughs> I think that you, you know, reveal that a lot in the book. So thank you so much. And thank I'm going to so hand much. it back over to Gail. And just so everybody can see, that's the, the finished product.